You ever been to a bad meeting? <laughs> Think about what made it bad. Because there's a lot of different varieties and flavors of the bad meeting. There is the useless meeting that happens every quarter or month and it takes longer to drive to get there than to actually do the meeting and you don't want to do it but you have to do it and so everyone just hates it. There's that flavor of bad meeting. There's the never-ending meeting where no one trusts anyone else to, to delegate and so you try to do it all there, right there in that meeting. Or the other flavor of the never-ending meeting where you can't stay on topic to save your life. There's the bad meeting that is the tense meeting because no one's talking about the real issue. There's the elephant in the room and no one's talking about it and so everything gets very awkward. There's the meeting that it's the personal agenda ambush meeting where what happens is not at all what's on paper. And that can sometimes turn into one of those worst case meetings where someone starts yelling at each other in the meeting and then after the yelling is done, you all look at each other and everyone's avoiding eye contact and you're not quite sure who's going to talk next. I've been at one of those. Ooh, baby, that was bad. Right, everyone, there are, there are many more flavors of bad meetings, but um, you know, the thing we use to try to keep our meetings from going bad is something called Robert's Rules of Order. Now, anyone here know the story of, of Mr. Robert? Anyone here? Oh, Mr. Robert, it's uh, Major Henry Robert. He was in the uh, United States uh, Armed Services. In 1876, he started writing down his rules of order for running a good meeting after a particularly egregious meeting. Anyone want to make a guess what type of meeting it was? Go ahead. Church. Robert's rules were written after a very bad church meeting. He was asked to lead a meeting and it just did not go well. So he wrote these rules and here is the purpose behind them and I quote, to enable assemblies of any size with due regard for every member's opinion to arrive at the general will on the maximum number of questions of varying complexity, in a minimum amount of time, and under all kinds of internal, this is the best part, and under all kinds of internal climate ranging from total harmony to hardened or impassioned division of opinion. That's a dude who's been to some bad meetings. <laughs> so, in the book of Acts, we have a, a few firsts that we were looking at before uh, Lent began. In the last of them, we would looked at the first sermon, the first martyr, and, and we were going to look at the first meeting, and then Missouri weather uh, did us in for a Sunday, and so we had to put that on pause. So we're coming back to that. This is your, your look at the first meeting of the church. It's in Acts 15, and it was that most elusive of events. It was a good meeting that handled a real debate, and it got worked out. It's kind of a great thing to have, one of those meetings. I want to take a look at that. But as with any meeting where there's a debate, there's always a backstory. And so we need to tell the story. How did this meeting come to pass? Well, what has happened is Paul has left Jerusalem. He's out there talking to people about Jesus, to anyone who will listen. And the way he's do going about it is he will show up at a town. And first he'll go to the Jewish uh, the synagogue, where he knows he'll find all the Jews on Sabbath. He talks to all the Jews at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Yay, Jesus. That's good. And then uh, he'll go to the, the Agora, is what it's called. The Agora is the, in every Greek-influenced uh, city, there was this place called the Agora, which is where you would go to debate and argue and hold forth. Like, if, if we want to chill, it'd be like Netflix and chill, turn on the TV and relax. If they wanted to debate, they could go to the Agora, and they could hear someone uh, teaching or philosophizing, etc., and so Paul go, went to the Agora so he could speak to people, and they, they would, would expect him to, 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 to say something. And both types of folks are responding. So there are Jews who are following Jesus, and then there are the Jews who are not following Jesus. And there's the Gentiles who are following Jesus, and then there are the Gentiles who are not following Jesus. And those four groups are all going to interact in a very interesting fashion. And so, as Paul and Barnabas, we read in Acts 13, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. He was being begged to preach some more. Okay, so he'll show up and preach some more next Sunday. 
Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue to follow Jesus. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. And the whole city, they're gathering at the Agora, so that they can hear, uh, that's where the city would gather. But when the Jews saw the crowds, the Jews who are not following Jesus, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, and now we are turning the Jews, and now we are turning to the Gentiles. And so what's happening is uh, Paul has gone to the synagogue, talked to the Jews, and some of the Jews who are following Jesus are excited, and then they go to the Agora, and they're talking to the rest of the city, and the Jews who are not following Jesus are going over to the Agora and raising a ruckus and challenging Paul and saying, you got it wrong. And so this is causing a bit of controversy. When the Gentiles heard this, uh, the Gentiles who were following Jesus, they began rejoicing and glorifying at the words that Paul was speaking. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, driving them out of the city. And so the Jews who are not following Jesus go to the Gentiles who are not following Jesus and say, we've got to get rid of these rabble-rousers, let's kick them out. And so they get Paul kicked out of the city. So that's not a good situation. I don't particularly fault the Jewish people for having a, 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 being confused about this. Like, in that time period, the only way to be a Jew was to be born a Jew. Like, there was no conversion route, there was no evangelism. The Jews weren't, like, going out and saying, hey, become a Jew, because the way you became a Jew is your mother was a Jew, and now you're a Jew, and that's that. And so for Paul to be going out and saying to the Jewish people, hey, Jesus, and then going over to the non-Jewish people, all the Jews are like, what? What, what, what are you offering them? We don't, we don't do that. Like, so they're very confused what's happening here. It keeps on being a problem. The next, uh, very next verse. They went to Iconium, and they did the same thing. They entered the synagogue of the Jews and spoke in such a manner that a large number of them believed. And then they go to the Agora, and they spoke such that a large number of the Greeks, the non-Jews, believed. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against those who did believe. Therefore, they spent a long time sp speaking boldly, untangling this, testifying to the word of his grace. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews who didn't believe, and some sided with the apostles who were trying to gather the Jews who did believe with the Gentiles who did believe. And so this is all, it sounds a bit complicated. It was. And while this is going down at the various cities, some people show up to help. You ever have someone show up to help? Yeah, this was help that didn't go over too well. So some, some Jews from uh, Jerusalem, they show up to help. And they're going to fill in the blanks that Paul hasn't gotten to. So uh, Acts 15, 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers and sisters who follow Jesus, saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're filling in the blanks, right? Paul is moving so fast, talking to so many people. We're, we'll just show up and help you understand. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to accept the circumcision, which is like signing a contract that you will follow all of the Jewish laws, all five, 573 of them. There's a whole bunch of them, right? You're going to take on this whole new way of life. It's not as simple as this saying, being baptized and following Jesus. You've got to accept this whole new lifestyle that you've never heard anything about again. And here, we're here to help you, help you figure out what this should look like. Paul does not appreciate this help. It's not his understanding of what should, what should happen. And so Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others should go to Jerusalem and have a meeting. So that's what happens. This is, it's time to have a meeting because whenever Paul goes into the city, you end up with the Jews who follow Jesus, the Gentiles who follow Jesus, the Jews who don't, the Gentiles who don't. And these two groups are getting together and causing problems. And if, as if that's not enough, then Jews from Jerusalem are showing up and they're telling the Gentiles who follow Jesus that they, if they don't start following all of the Jewish laws, they're damned. 
And so it's time to have a meeting, get it all cleared out. How are we going to do this? So they, they do it. Right? Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they pass through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, bringing great joy to all of them. And they arrived at Jerusalem, received by the church and the apostles and the elders, reporting what had happened. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, which were the Jews, uh, who were very, uh, very strict in their adherence to Jewish law, stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. If we're going to work this hard at following Jesus, they need to work this hard at following Jesus, and they need to follow Jesus just like we follow Jesus. Right? That, that's the argument that's being made here. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter, and after there had been much debate. Now, this is the sentence that it's tempting to glide right past, because right after it says, after there had been much debate, Peter then stands up and says, this is what we're going to do, and everyone agrees to do that. But I don't think we should rush past this phrase, much debate, because there is a very real debate that occurs here. Now, if you remember, Acts is written in the first century, and so everyone in that culture knew the, what the debate was that they had. In the same way that if I say, and the Senate had a great debate about gun control, do I need to flesh in the details? Or do you know how that unfolds, right? You know how that goes. And in the same way, when he says there was a great debate, he doesn't fill in the details because, well, everyone who was reading it in the first century, they knew the details in the same way that you know the details. Just pick a hot button issue, and if I say there was a great debate about marriage or gun control or taxes, you know how that unfolds. Well, we don't know how this unfolds. It's not part of our culture anymore. So I, I want to share with you the two sides of this debate. There are two sides, and one side is arguing that everyone should be able to follow Jesus, and they should be able to do it in their way as long as they attend to following Jesus, the two great commandments, right? Love Lord your God, love your neighbor. The other side of this debate it is saying that if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to follow Jesus like a Jew because Jesus is a Jew. And so there are these two sides of this debate. And I, want to find, I wanted to find someone who could argue with me, but I didn't want to have to make any of you do that. And so I was looking around, who can argue with me? I'll argue with you. Hmm, that's fitting. Hello, Andy. How are you doing? Let's see. Uh, well, that's, that's convenient. I will argue. Uh, let's see. I will argue. Anyone here argue with yourself? I argue with myself on a regular basis. I'll argue with myself in front of you now. I will argue on the side of Paul. And I will argue for the side of the Jewish law. Well, I'm going to be polite. Why don't you go first, Andy? Jesus himself said that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So the law is here to stay. True. But Jesus also said that the greatest two commandments were to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And so in that doing so, this fulfilled the law. So if we teach the non-Jews these two, these two things, that should be enough. But Jesus, a Jew, lived according to the Jewish law, so anyone who wants to follow him should do the same thing. Yes, but it is the failure of the law that brings us to today. And if we failed to be able to follow the law, why should we try to make them follow the law? Yet we Jews are God's chosen people, and we were told to live a certain way. We cannot ditch that. I'm not saying we have to. We can continue to follow Jesus in, in a Jewish fashion, and they can follow Jesus and, and not follow all of the Jewish customs. We can do our own separate ways of following Jesus. Don't forget that the prophets talk about the nations coming to us, coming to God's holy mountain, going, coming up to the temple, so that they might learn the word of the Lord. Indeed it does. But as we go to them, their lives are changing and the Spirit is moving, and so that might just be a metaphor, and we just need to go to them. Most importantly, if we don't hold on to what makes us God's people, we might lose what is essential. We are the circumcised people marked by our commitment to the covenant. But if we don't give all the people the good news of Jesus, we'll be disobeying Jesus' commandment to go make disciples. 
Now, I could continue like this, but I think you get the point, right? This is an argument. There are two real sides of this, and, and, and there, the two sides of it are, are boiling down to this, right? It is essential that we be Jewish because Jesus is a Jew, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be follow in a Jewish fashion. And, and the, art, the response of, you don't have to be Jewish to follow Jesus, just, just get the essentials, and if you're not following all of the laws, it's okay. In the midst of this debate, Peter steps up and uh, he says his piece. And we have it recorded because it ends up being the argument that persuades people to bring them together. And what Peter says is, I've been to the Gentiles and it's been odd. They served me pork. Ugh. But it worked, right? We have seen the fruit of the Spirit in these people, and lives have changed, and it is obvious that God is at work in these people. So let's not make them do what we could not do ourselves. And after this meeting, after much debate, a letter was written. And you can read the letter on the front of your bulletin. This is the letter that was sent to everyone who was out, outside of Jerusalem. From the apostles and leaders, your friends... To our friends in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Hello! We heard that some men from our church went to you and said things that confused and upset you. Mind you, they had no authority from us. We didn't send them. Isn't that kind of a graceful way to undercut them? Or maybe it's not so graceful. We have agreed unanimously to pick representatives and send them to you with our good friends Barnabas and Saul. We picked men we knew you could trust. Judas and Silas, they've looked death in the face time and again for the sake of our Master Jesus Christ. We've sent them to confirm in a face-to-face -face meeting with you what we've written. It seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us that you should not be saddled with any crushing burden, but be responsible only for those bare, these bare necessities. Be careful not to get involved in activities connected to idols. Avoid serving food offensive to Jewish Christians, blood for instance, and guard the morality of sex and marriage. These guidelines are sufficient to keep relations congenial between us and God be with you. This set of three things lines up with the Jewish tradition of what they ask of people who are traveling through town. If you're going to travel through town, you don't have to follow all the Jewish laws, but could you at least not worship other gods? Uh, don't eat anything strangled and cooked in its own blood, and uh, respect the importance of marriage and, and, and sexuality. What is key is to remember that this is making it easy to decide to follow Jesus. Well, that's the purpose here, right? Who should be able to follow Jesus? Anyone who can say yes to this. And then following Jesus, remember Paul stays with people for years, teaching them to pray and to study scripture and to worship together, to give towards the common good, to serve those who are hungry. Right? So following Jesus, it's easy to start, and then it takes a lifetime to figure out and practice how to do, which is actually in line with our Methodist tradition. The, to join the Methodist tradition, the Methodist church in England under John Wesley, here was the requirement, one requirement. Do you uh, desire to flee the wrath to come? That's it. Do you desire to flee the wrath to come? Then you're in, let's do this, right? So it is easy to begin to follow Jesus, and then it, it becomes a challenge over time to work out how. And I think it's important to go back to this meeting and its results for two reasons. First is to remember that all people are welcome. I mean, we say all people are welcome. We say when we come to this table, this is Christ's table. He invites to this table all who love him. But this is the to ask what does it take to be able to come to this church, I think it's a modern version of what we read here. Worship Jesus alone. Don't do the thing that gives everyone in the room the heebie-jeebies. Right? Back then, it was eating something cooked in its own blood. What would give everyone in the room the heebie-jeebies if we did it right now? Don't answer that, but don't do it. Right? That, that, that's what we ask. <laughs> And respect the importance and sanctity of sex. That, that, that's, if you can do those things, come on in. Those are the basics. And then join us and become part of what we're doing. This continues our belief that all are welcome. And then once you're welcome here, we will strive together to follow Jesus. The other reason I think this meeting is worth looking at is it reminds us what a good meeting looks like. Because there's not much worse than a bad meeting. And we'd rather much rather have good meetings 
But we need to have meetings that can engage topics that are challenging. As soon as you start doing things, you're going to have disagreements. The, the quickest way to have everyone get along is to stop. Stop everything. If you do something, you're going to end up in disagreements. And we're going to do things here. So we are going to have disagreements, which means we will have to have meetings which will discuss how we handle it. And the Bible does not sugarcoat that this had, was a fairly device, divisive topic. But once they came out with this letter, we don't hear about it again. It got resolved. And isn't that what you hope for? You have a meeting, you hash through it, and then it's done. Right? You hate coming. Why are we talking about this again? I hate those meetings. That, that to me is a bad meeting. A meeting where you go back and you think, we, I thought we were done with this. Right? They went through it and they got done. And they moved on. And the way they did it is that they were all reading scripture together. They looked at the experience of the church, what was working, and then they made their decision. They sent this letter, they came to a conclusion, and that was that. A beautiful thing. And sometimes you have a meeting and you don't have the experience or the data you need to make the decision, but once you've made it, that's that. And the church in Acts thrived because of this is part of it. They made their decisions and then they lived by it. And I believe that continues to be true today. For nothing tears a church apart faster than internal conflict. Right? You start fighting internally and people just leave. It's one of the reasons people don't come to church is if they hear about a particular church that is having internal conflict, conflict that is mishandled, ignored, left to fester. It just has to be engaged and handled. And to read Acts 15 sustains my hope that as followers of Jesus Christ who gather together, that go out and do what matters, we will come to disagreements, but those disagreements can be handled and communicated and then moved on from so we can get back to the main purpose, which is being able to invite all people into the church. But if when you do come to the church, please don't do that the thing that gives everyone the heebie-jeebies. Can you do that? Like, this be willing to be part of, of inviting people to church just as they are so they can join us in following Jesus together. Amen.